Good morning, church. How are you today? Happy Sunday. Woo. I would encourage you to stand and let's do a little something before we get started. Uh, this next song we're going to sing, the, the first song says, Sea of Victory. And I started thinking, how many times in our Christian life do we count our victories? And I don't know about you, but in my life, hardly do I do that. I usually look at, like, the things that are going not well, and then I say, Lord, help me. Um, I think we've all been there. But let's take a moment. I would encourage you to just close your eyes and talk to God before we get started in, in worship. And just say, thank you, God, for the victory that you gave me in at home, at work, with my mom, wherever, whatever it is. Just let's give thanks to God today before we get started in worship and come with a heart of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude before the Lord. So just say something, something simple as a, as a prayer like, Lord, I thank you for the victory in and whatever you fill in that space. So I invite you to close your eyes and just talk to God before we get started in worship. Thank you. week, the last few months, the last month or so, Father, let's just be grateful for the times that you have provided the victory. And that victory may be not necessarily what we, we didn't get what we wanted, but we definitely got what we needed, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Sing it, church, my God. My God will never fail. Sing it again. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, there's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. And I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how the story ends. Sing it again. Oh, I know how the story ends. Sing it, church. And I'm going to see you. I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good, you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You 
turn it for good. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. The battle belongs to you, Lord. Sing it, church. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Amen. Are, there we go. Hey, there we go. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Metropolitan Ministries is trying to do 2,000 backpacks for students who otherwise would not be able to, uh, you know, pay for that. It's a lot of money, you know. It's, it's, so it's, and so students that would not be able to, we, we stuffed them, and they're going to send them, and they're, you know, students from around uh, the four or five different counties here are going to be provided for for that so thank you for those who served with that that's a very good good thing we're going to look for more opportunities for families to be able to serve in that way so we can be the hands and feet of christ uh, another opportunity is we want to be able to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries with you all uh, but we don't necessarily know all of them um, the good thing is is that we have this church management software program called realm that each of us have an account with I'm looking at the church secretary over here, membership secretary, and she wished everybody would get on that thing so we could get going with it. Uh, we've not done the best job, perhaps, of putting this out to everybody, but you all have the opportunity right now. If you know Miss Sue Shea in the office, you can contact her either via uh, email or phone. Just call the office, and she will set you up with a Realm account. You're able to uh, see your financial giving. You're able to... Uh, update any of those other things, your address, phone number, email, also anniversaries, so that we can celebrate these things with you. Uh, so I hope that you'll also take advantage of that. We also have another announcement that hopefully as you came in or as you go out today, uh, we are blessed to be in a community where uh, Baldomero Lopez is very, very close and that we have some veterans that we need to find ways to honor more. We did find ourselves in there uh, singing and just kind of visiting with them when we were able. Now, we're not able at this time, but we are able to bring encouragement through a card. And it's so simple for us to be able to do so. There's about 90 of them in that place. We've done a lot of the work for you. Uh, Ms. Shannon Crable has produced some cards, and they're out in the lobby. You just kind of take one as you leave and bring them back before August 16th. Uh, there's 90 of them. I know that our church can handle that. Take a couple of them and uh, just love on those uh, for the work that they've done, the hard work, and obviously we want to celebrate those veterans. Uh, do we have one more? We have one more. The last one is this. We know that we've been in prayer for Cuba, specifically for our sister church, that we have a, a close relationship and, and a growing close relationship with them. Uh, we give them $300 a year 
and that doubles the, the annual salary of the pastor. $300 a year. So perspective, right? We've just recently sent an additional $500 to our sister church, and we are inviting you all uh, that if you don't already give to the 60 cents a day campaign that goes to missions, you can also give towards that. You can write a check, put Cuba in the memo, and we'll make sure that it gets there. You can also do that through e-giving, and it is a drop-down on the menu of through Realm uh, that you can also give to Cuba as well. So there's lots of things going on. We're serving here locally. We're serving abroad in that sense, um, and the Lord is good. Amen? Amen? All right, well, let's, uh, let's pray and worship the Lord. Father God, we give you thanks for these announcements, these things that have been done, these things that are going to be done. Uh, it's all about spreading the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ and his life, death, and resurrection and what it means for us, Lord. And so God, as we bow our knee and we lift up holy hands, we just pray, God, that you and your spirit would stir amongst us, God, that you would make us come alive and know that you love us that you never leave us, never forsake us, that the victory will be ours because the victory was won by you on the cross. And so we give you thanks for that, and we celebrate that this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name, and God's church said, amen, amen. I invite you all to stand. Your goodness is running after, it's 
running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. Come on, church, sing it to God. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, God will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Isn't it true? Amen. Amen to that. And isn't it true that God's been good? In my prayer earlier, I said, God, you have given us everything we needed, not necessarily everything we wanted. And um, I remember when, um, when my son was about 14 years old, and he said, wow, Dad, I really would like to drive. And I said, Lord, please help me. because I, And I think some parents may know. If not, you will. Uh, but here's the thing. Um, if you would ask me what kind of car he wanted, um, not that I could afford it, uh, but he wanted a Maserati and red, right? So here's the thing. He didn't get the Maserati <laughs> that he wanted, but he did get a car that he needed. And I, what I mean by that is when uh, we helped him with, with the car, this is what happened. I said, this is for the Lord. And I remember my mom said that to me many years ago. And I said, yes, mom, it's for the Lord. I had no idea what that meant, but I said, like, yes, mom. It's for the Lord. But what I meant by that is you're going to use it. What God has given you, he will use for his honor and his glory. That to me, back when I was 18, about 400 years ago, um, was this. I would help people come to church that didn't have a ride. Amen? Amen. You use what God has given you. If it's not what you wanted, but it's what you needed. So I would be insane as a father to give him a Maserati, right? And red, imagine, at 14. Wow. But that's how God is. I started thinking, like, isn't that how God is? Like, sometimes we ask, like, oh, God, give me that job. And then he gives you that job, and then the boss is so horrible. And God's like, that's your job. Your job is not your job. It's your boss to give him, bring him to Christ, bring him to Jesus. Amen? And sometimes, you know, in life, it's like we don't get it. Like, I don't get it. I'll start with myself. Like, I've gotten that job, and it's like that boss that, I don't know if any of you have. And boss, if you're listening, I love you. No, I'm just saying. But here's the thing. God gives each and every one of us what we need. And he started with Jesus. See, the only way to God in the relationship is through Jesus. It's not through religion. It's not through tradition. Those things are wonderful. But it's only through Jesus Christ in a relationship with him. And he is the one that's our cornerstone. The Bible says that in a building, there's a cornerstone. There's a, there's a firm foundation. Then there's a cornerstone. They say that cornerstone is Jesus. So there's no other, it's not by good acts. No matter how good David can be, it's not enough to reach to God. It's only through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and he is our cornerstone, amen? Sing it, 
church, Christ alone. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak and strong in the state. and just think about those lyrics that we are faultless in Jesus no matter what we've done God is gracious enough to forgive if we confess our sins and turn away from them and we have access to God and a relationship with God through Jesus and it's in Christ alone that we have it Christ alone, cornerstone, sing it church, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm.
you know, the beauty about coming and singing and being able to, it is making it tangible. It's making it a witness about, you know, illustrations of like cars and how God provides what we need and what we, not necessarily what we want. And I think about the lyrics of Through the Storm. I mean, it's, you know, our faith is one where it's all about the, it's, it's not a, around the storm. It's through the storm, right? It's through the storm. And we have a couple names here that I'm lifting up in prayer, uh, one of which is um, a friend of Connie Edwards who probably greeted you as you came in the door. Dr. Willie McRae is a chiropractor friend and, uh, of hers in Daytona that uh, it looks like um, he, he has some cancer that we were praying away, but um, the tumor unfortunately has grown and spread, and so we are lifting up uh, Dr. Willie McRae in prayer um, along with Connie Edwards and some of the others who uh, are friends and, and family as well. Um, I haven't seen Jeannie Sturm, uh, Jean Sturm here this morning. Is she not here? Okay. They're at home. Okay. Hey, well, then they're, I'm looking at them right there at the camera. There you go. Uh, and we're praying for Wendy. Continue to pray for Wendy. And uh, we have praying, been praying for her sister. Uh, radiation did a lot to shrink the tumors. Uh, but unfortunately, immunotherapy is making tumors come back. And so we are praying for the chemo. Uh, to do to do its work, uh, as I've, we kind of witnessed in our life uh, with with Kelly and chemo, and, and how God can use use the doctor's hands, Amen. And so God will use all these different tools uh, to receive glory and to uh, heal His people. Uh, I know that there are other storms that you all have in your own lives uh, that you are thinking of even as we speak. And so um, let's let's pray about those. Father, we we know that you hear our voice not because we are, as we just said, deserving of it. Um, and you could cast us aside, and you would be right in doing so, yet at the same time, we find ourselves coming to your throne and coming on bended knees in worship of you because, because of Jesus. We find ourselves faultless, which I can't help but nod and, and think, think about that, Lord, that we find ourselves faultless before you because of what your son Jesus has done. So, God, it's in that approach and it's in that heart that we bring these prayer requests to you, these storms of our lives, whatever those things are, Lord, you know them. And we pray, God, that you would minister to each one according to your perfect wisdom, your perfect judgment. God, we, we love you and we are grateful that you love us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite for you to be seated as we continue in worship.
be your land to these troubles, but until that day comes, we'll live to know you're here on the earth, and I will fear no evil, for my God is with shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? We stand as we sing. Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord. You never let go invite you to stand as we sing that we can see the light Jesus yes I can see a light that is coming the heart that holds on and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes oh still I will praise you still I will I can see a light, oh, yeah, see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on, and there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, oh, still I will praise you, still I will praise you. chorus one more time. Oh, 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 no, you never let go through the storm. Oh, no. High and every low. Oh, no, you never let go. Lord, you never let go of me. Just the vocal, I'd like to hear that. Just chord it, David. Sing that chorus again. Oh, no. Through the storm. Oh, no. Every high. Oh, no. You never let go. Lord, you never let go of me. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, come before your presence. Father, not just in song. Father, songs are beautiful, beautiful gifts of you. Music is beautiful, beautiful gift of you. But Father, may we come with our hearts just open and ready to receive your word. And to receive it to make a difference in our lives. Father, I just don't want to come another Sunday and say, okay, I heard a message and I'm going to go out throughout the week. But I want this message, I want your word to just penetrate in, our, in my life, in our lives, so we could be more like Jesus, so we could infect and affect others around us, Father, in our jobs, in our own families. Thank you that you never let go of us. We have that promise that even when we don't get the things that we want, we have that what we need which is salvation through Jesus, and then all the blessings that come after that. We thank you for Pastor Kevin, for his family. Father, it's not enough that we come up here and we just pray for them, and we just thank you for them. Thank you for their lives, for their, for their just desire to serve you, for his obedience and his family's obedience to, to just come and, and, and serve us in preaching the word and sharing life together. So, Father, as a body of Christ, that we are all here together, united, and even online, Father, that we may receive of you 
today. Take out our stubbornness, our pride that gets in the way of our relationship. Father, and just, just humble us. That we wouldn't get to know who Jesus is because he's the example. And if we don't know the example, well, well we, then we can't live. Because we don't know the example. So help us to understand who Jesus is, is in our lives. And it's only through Jesus that we have life everlasting. I thank you for each family, each person represented here today. I ask for your blessings upon them. As we receive of you, God, we have given you a song, our hearts. But at this time, Father, I pray that you just come down and just work in our lives. And help us to understand that we don't always get what we want. But that we have that, what we need. We love you and the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray the body of Christ says, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Indoris, for leading us in worship. David's right. If you're not in the right frame of mind, if you're not positioned right, you can't receive anything. It's like hitting a, a wall, stony heart, hard, hardened heart for sure. Praying that away. Well, church, as uh, the summer wraps up, at least according to the, the school calendar, uh, I know the school buses kind of dictate the calendar around here. We're going to see it get busy around here very soon. Um, the temperature, not so much. It's still, it's still going to be summer for a long, long time. But uh, as we have the last seven weeks, we have some photos here of your journeys throughout the summer and just kind of in the community. Larry and Bride are there. Kathy, uh, I don't remember. I, I, I lost my notes. I don't know where you're at there. But you all look good, and you look like, you know, you're rested and having a good time. So that's the important part. And the, unlike last week where there was just a ship and no uh, Larry and Kathy, they're in this photo. So this is good. We're doing great. Um, and I, this couple, uh, Chuck and Moni, just recently celebrated 60 years of marriage. And I think, was this for a birthday, though? This was for a birthday. Moni, did you? 80 years. 80 years. That's right. That's right. This was Friday. Enjoying that. And we already said the Sturms are at home, and you guys are at, let's see, Bodie Island Light Station. Looks like you and your family enjoying each other there. And uh, this is the foils going uh, skiing on their ski lake. Even the dog got in the action. So even the dog skis, which is pretty cool. And that is Kyle. He's on the back with the white hat and just hanging out with his friends. I think there's some pool photos as well them just kind of hanging out in the pool. Again, we're not looking for anything extravagant here. We just want to see the people out and about enjoying life and just enjoying each other's company. We, again, it's just a reminder that each person matters here, and uh, we want you to, to see that uh, see that as well. I think, is that it for our photos? And we have some more. That's right. Awesome. Awesome. It's actually that family is the one that's providing for the, the cards uh, for, the, um, for the veterans' home as well. So, Anyway, so the purpose of our journey as we have been doing it uh, through the Psalms has really for, been for us to connect to the different kinds of Psalms. We could have gone through Psalm 139 or Psalm 23 or some of the more common ones, but there's 150 of them. We're, we weren't going to get all of them, and we're really just trying to get through a portion of them, ones that will connect with us. Um, you know, these are songs, these are prayers, and though they are thousands of years old, they still speak to us, and they connect with us. Um, and, and they are God's word to us, but they are also our words back to God that we can offer these as prayers, as they are our own, our own words. So when you feel joy, you can read and, and sing a praise hymn. Uh, when you're doubting God's presence or God's power or God's, um, you know, character, there are psalms of confidence that you can read and, and restore that right relationship with God and understand. When you need answers for something, there are wisdom psalms to remind us that there are places that we can gain true and perfect wisdom. When you struggle with personal sin or you are uh, just distraught about life circumstances, those storms that we were just talking about, rather than running away from God, you can run towards God in the lament psalms. Um, the idea is that in God, revealed, revealed uh, through his word, we have uh, different places that we can turn to in every circumstance in his word. 
But where do you go if you're angry? Where do you turn to when you're angry, like really, really angry, like you drove in your car here and you don't keep a weapon in your car because you've seen how people drive, okay? Just like, I better not have a weapon near me when I'm around this person, that kind of anger, right? Like blood boiling anger. You know what I'm talking about. The Psalms offer a voice for every emotion under the sun, but what about anger? What do we do? Where do we turn when we are angry at someone with so, with so much passion um, that it seems like, well, let's just say that our life is not congruent with Jesus' teachings, okay? Like when we're, we're this kind of angry, what do we do with those kind of thoughts, those kind of emotions, those kind of feelings? Well, there's a psalm for that too, right? I feel like I want to say like, and just wait, and wait, you just, you know, like a two-for-one deal or something. Uh, there's, there's actually about six of them. There's, there's psalms for that too, a half dozen or so, that offers a voice to the angry soul. Uh, they're often called imprecatory psalms, which imprecatory is just a big word that means curse. There's curses, and that's really not, it's a misnomer to call them imprecatory psalms. They're lament psalms. They're, you're lamenting to God, and within the lament, or the psalm of confidence, you're also calling down some curses on people. Okay, so like, we're going we're gonna to get to it here in a second. Um, and, there, and when I say curse, I'm not saying curse words. You know, don't search the psalms looking for F-bombs. Like, that's, that's not a thing. You're not going to find that. Um, but there are individual curses that are being called upon other people in a prayer towards God. And the one I want to look at is Psalm 109. I originally had Psalm 5, but Psalm 109, hey, we're, we're, we're going for the granddaddy of them all. And this one is pretty, pretty tough. Um, and we're not going to read the whole thing because it's 31 verses, but we're going to start in verse 6. And just in context, this is another Psalm of David. And David is... Uh, again, crying out because he feels betrayed, he feels abandoned, he feels like he had some friends, and now those friends have turned into enemies, and those enemies are telling him that he's doing, saying things that he hasn't done, that he's, they're making up lies about him, and he is hot. I mean, David is angry. Like, we've seen him cry, now he's crying out in anger. And we've all been there. But I want you to hear God's words, beginning with verse 6. We're going to read through verse 20. He says, Appoint someone evil to oppose my enemy. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him be found guilty, and may his prayers condemn him. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children be wandering beggars. May be, they be driven from their ruined homes. May a creditor seize all he has. May strangers plunder in the fruits of his labor. May no one extend kindness to him or take pity on his fatherless children. May his descendants be cut off, their names blotted out from the next generation. May the iniquity of his fathers is to remembered, be remembered before the Lord. May the sin of his mother be blo never be blotted out. May their sins always remain before the Lord that he may blot out their name from the earth. For he never thought of doing a kindness, but hounded to death the poor and the needy and the brokenhearted. He loved to pronounce a curse. May it come back on him. He found no pleasure in blessing. May it be far from him. He wore cursing as his garment that entered into his body like water, into his bones like oil. May it be like a cloak wrapped around him, like a belt tied forever around him. May this be the Lord's payment to my accusers, to those who speak evil of me. Whew. Whew. Man, that's, never felt like that before? <laughs> we need a confession booth in here, right? It's like, goodness. I mean, that's spicy right there. Um, yeah, you know, so some believe that, if you read this from the, this is the NIV, the NRSV actually says that version has that in quotations, as if it, those were the words said to David, not from David. However, verse 20 clears this up, and it says, may this be the Lord's payment to my accusers, to those who speak evil of me. So if those words didn't originate with David, he's just serving them back and saying, these are now my words. So the thing is with this is that this is David. This is who the Bible says that is called a man after God's own heart. It says those words. And these are harsh, harsh words. So how do we reconcile that? How do we say that's God's word? That's as, as important as any scripture in the Bible. So what do you do with these words? There's a half dozen, dozen psalms just like it. Do we just throw them out? Should I just tear, start to tear this out of my Bible and just for, forget about it? You know, some of these, some would say, well, I, I'm, I'm, I read the New Testament, and that doesn't seem like Jesus to me. So I, I don't, what do you do with that? 
But like I said, there's another half dozen psalms that are like this. I could have gone with, I said that this was the granddaddy of them all because there's another, you know, there's 20 verses that speak like this. But Psalm 137, verse 9, is probably the toughest thing that you're going to read in Scripture. And it says, happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Can we just say a collective, that's in God's word. Oh, my gosh. What? I mean, I... You read that and you go like, okay, I'm, I'm done. I don't know what to do with that, right? And this is a prayer. This is actually a song. I mean, it says on my Bible, it says Psalm 109, for the director of music. <laughs> I mean, how does that work? I was thinking, David, maybe next week we're going to sing this psalm to the tune of 10,000 Reasons. So here we go. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their ruined home. It, I mean, I, it's catchy, right? I, mean, it's, I, I don't know how to do that. I mean, it's just, it would, this would be comical if it weren't serious. This would be comical if these thoughts and emotions and feelings did not find their way into our own heart from time to time. You may have never cursed someone with the words, may their sins always remain before the Lord, that he may blot out their name from the earth. But you've wished harm on someone. You've prayed for it. You've asked. You've cursed someone. Some of us have gone through some portion of life, and you've come in, in contact with some people, and you've thought to yourself, I wish that person were dead. Some of us have had these feelings, these thoughts. Now, I want to believe that everybody here is a perfect angel, but I know that what Psalm 109 does is it teaches us that this is our nature, that we can be vindictive, we can be vengeful people, and each of us can identify with this language. And these kind of feelings are within us even from a very early age. I have a friend who tells me about, he was reading a story with his five-year-old daughter, and um, he said it got a little bit awkward as they were reading this story. He says that they were reading the story of the children's book together, and there were these bears that were characters in the story, and one bear offended the, another bear and excluded them from an activity on the playground, and it hurt their feelings. And, and the, of course, the, it ends with a happy ending. That bear learns his lesson and, and treats the other bear nicely and goes on and uh, understands that he did something wrong and that he rights his wrong and, and starts to, you know, live a, a, nice, a nice life treating people with kindness. Well, his daughter didn't like that ending. His daughter was like, what? N no. No, that bear's got to get his, right? And, and she actually wrote in her mind this other story that, like in her, like there's a new ending where the bear felt the same exclusion. Like, no, 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 he needs to go into the same playground and have people point and make fun of him and make him feel excluded as well. Like that was within this five-year-old little girl as well. So it starts at an early age, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, five-year-old girl. Psalm 109 teaches us that that is within all of us. So what do we do with it? What do we do with a scripture like this? Well, some of you have been taught that Thoughts, feelings, emotions like this are off limits. Like, just tuck them away. Those are not of the Lord, and so just don't, don't think like that. And so when we find this in Scripture, it too must be wrong. If it's wrong within us, it's wrong within Scripture. Just rip it out. You know, this is the only reason it's, I've been told that the only reason why it's in Scripture in the first place as is it's the non-example. It's, it's to show us how not to pray. So what do you do when you encounter, when you believe that something is contradictory in Scripture? That when you read something in the Old Testament, you read something in the New Testament, they don't seem to, to line up. When you really have a New Testament faith, you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read Jesus, and you're like, I get Jesus. Jesus is loving, he's kind, he's caring. I understand that. I think I understand Jesus. You read through the rest of the New Testament, you read through Paul's letters, the rest of the letters, and you go, I get it. Love God love others, right? Love God, love others, I got it. I, I kind of got the basic premise of this. What happens when you take that faith and then you encounter a, a psalm like this one, a psalm where you, you're starting to read it and you're like, okay, is this Jonathan Edwards sinners in the hands of an angry God? But like, what, what am I reading here? Like, this is, this is harsh stuff. This can't be God's word. It's too hate-filled. It's too vengeful. It's, it's spiteful. It seems incongruent with Jesus' teachings. It can't be right. Most of us who have read Scripture have had these conversations with ourselves when we read things that seem like they're incongruent. And so it does something within us, and we go, I don't know how to feel about that, right? And somebody says, I get Jesus, right? He's loving, he, he makes sense. 
but the God of the Old Testament doesn't make sense to me. Some of the writing is just too hate-filled. It doesn't make sense to me. And then somebody says, well, you know that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection means that Old Testament's irrelevant. He just outrights it out. It's just, just don't, don't worry about that anymore. If, there's, if you read something in the Old Testament, something in the New Testament, Jesus breaks the tie. I had somebody tell me that one time. Jesus breaks the tie. Uh, I'm like, okay, that's interesting. So is that true? Right? Do, you, do we just dismiss the Old Testament texts that we don't like because they make us uncomfortable? Right? It, it wouldn't look good on a bumper sticker. Certainly Psalm 109, you're not going to see in a bumper sticker. Maybe you should while you're driving. I don't know. I've seen people drive out there. But you don't dismiss those thoughts and feelings. The Lord is not asking us to do that. You don't dismiss those passages of Scripture. We believe that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And even in our, in our um, membership vows, we actually are reminded that what we believe in the New Testament is the same as what we believe in the Old Testament. We believe both. So we don't dismiss these psalms. So what do we do with them? Well, Psalm 109, in the psalms, in the psalms that are like it, not only, not only teach us about uh, how we think these thoughts and we feel these feelings, but it teaches us not to dismiss these things. Right? There's a way to a better response. Jesus' Jesus's teachings do offer a better answer. They do. All right, there is a better response to answer, but they may not be our first response. Right? The Lord is not done with me yet. Right? Sometimes my first response is not what would Jesus would have. Right? So what do you do with that? There is a way beyond the heart of anger where we send curses down on people, but it's not around. Right? It's like the storms we're talking about. It's not around. It's through. It's through these things. The Psalms are a vehicle for us. They're a tool for us to be able to dialogue with God, no matter what we're feeling. John Wesley would call them a means of grace. They're the means of grace in which we have access and closeness to God. We lament so that we can get to the other side of our cry. We have expressions of anger so that we grow closer to Jesus. What would be sinful gossip, gossip said in a church pew of another member, offered to God becomes faithful petition. Right? What would be a vengeful curse spoken to anyone else becomes a plea of helpless dependence on God. Do you see the difference there as, as these become prayers? The other options are this. If you ignore those, those angry feelings that you have, you're going to resent God. You're going to say that God is telling you to shut your mouth and just you're not allowed to be angry, and you'll resent God. The other option is that you take vengeance in your own, hand, at your own hands, whatever that looks like, it, and that was never going to bring you closer to God. Psalm 109 is actually a very faithful prayer because it is one praying, uh, the one praying it is truly believing that God is holy and that God is just and he's going to take care of things in the end. And just to emphasize the point, let me show you how the Old Testament and New Testament are actually incongruent. I know that as I've been talking about Jesus' teachings, they've been in your mind, so let me read a couple. Matthew 5, 38 through 40 says, You have heard it that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, do what? Turn the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. That's how you handle things, Jesus said. Matthew 5, 44 says, You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And it's not just Jesus' words, right? It's throughout the New Testament. Romans 12, 14 says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. There it is right there. Does that seem contradictory from what we just read in this, right? You're saying that that psalm is okay. Then how, which of those two? Romans 12, 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But all of these passages aren't an invitation to let people walk on you, to just tuck away these feelings, tuck away these emotions, and dismiss them. Right? Each of these texts that I just read is an invitation to truly trust God. That's what Jesus is inviting us into. Truly trust God to take care of things in the end, to be the just God that he is. To turn the other cheek is an encouragement to, wrong, to ignore the wrongdoing. It's not going, hey, you're wrong is not wrong anymore. Hit the other cheek. No, it's to say, God, you're going to take care of this. It's not mine to take care of. All right? It's actually a faithful response to allow the Lord to carry out the justice, to let God set things right, to trust it, 
these words of Psalm 109 and other psalms like it are actually expressions of deep, deep trust in God. When we say in, in the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that's saying in this context, I'm not going to take it into my own hands. That would be my will be done. I'm going to let your will be done. Um, sometimes that means something, as David said, was, we're talking about today, it's not what you want, it's what you need. Right? Sometimes God's version of justice looks different than our version of justice. Do you remember the story of Jonah? Right? Jonah is a prophet in the Old Testament who God sends to a place called Nineveh. And Nineveh is messed up. These Ninevites are messed up, bad people, right? And, and, and God says, you've got to go down there and go tell them that they're about to be judged. I'm going to smite them if they don't turn their way and repent. Right? And what ends up happening is they repent. And what does Jonah do? Jonah stomps his feet and goes, why are you letting them repent, right? I want them to be damned. I want them to be judged. I want them to be cursed. I want those things to happen to them. And that's not what happens because that's not God's perfect judgment. That's not his plan. His plan is for them to turn their life around. Sometimes judgment looks like that, and we have to be okay with it. The point is, is that we don't have perfect wisdom. Right? We don't know what perfect justice is. Whatever your situation is, we, don't, we have to trust the Lord in our anger. We have to trust the Lord with our thoughts and our feelings, with the reality that judgment will come and it will be the Lord's. I'm going to close with this, close this morning with a, a parable found in, in Luke chapter 18 where Jesus teaches the very same point that I believe these imprecatory psalms teach us. It says this in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will seek that she gets me justice. She gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? He will, will, will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus' parable teaches us that ultimately the same message is the case, that justice will be the Lord's. We have to trust it in the Lord's hands. Um, the last thing he says, though, is interesting. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man throughout the Gospels. And here he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The Son of Man, um, again, is what Jesus says of himself. And he says, when I come, will I find people that feel anger, that feel and think these angry thoughts, but don't actually bring them to me in prayer? Will I, people, will I find people who say that they trust me? Will I find people who say that they believe that I'm just? Will I find people who say that they believe that I'm sovereign? Will I find people who say that they believe in the end that I will make all things right, as Romans 8, 28, we were just singing about it, right? Will I find that person who says those things but ends up taking revenge in their own hands? Or will I find disciples, followers of mine, students of mine that come to me with the prayers that are messy, that aren't cleaned up, that are that make your mama blush, right? Will, will, will I find that disciple that might not offer the best and final response to anger but are absolutely prayers and faith, trusting that God is going to receive them and going to work on our hearts and do something with them? Will I find disciples who put their whole faith in me, even though in the moments of life when they find themselves disturbingly angry? We've all gotten there, disturbingly angry. This is God's call and our challenge and challenge to us this morning. And as we come down to uh, communion, the communion table this morning, um, you may have noticed in the scripture that some of the language in this sounds eerily similar to Jesus's uh, last days. Um, I think it's, as I read this, you will hear that perhaps just as Jesus's uh, ancestor David felt abandonment and betrayal 
Jesus, generations later, would feel the same way. Listen to these words. For people who are wicked and deceitful have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues. With words of hatred, they surround me. They attack me without cause. In return for my friendship, they accuse me. But I am a man of prayer. They repay me evil for good and hatred for my friendship. These words of David echo a thousand years into the future in Jesus' experience of suffering. And aren't these words reflective of Jesus' relationship with Judas, right, the ultimate of betrayer? And I think as we come to this table, this table that is not of the United Methodist Church, it's not of this church, it's the Lord's table, that all are invited to. As we come to this table, maybe we would reflect that quite often our relationship with the Lord is that of a betrayer, that what God offers us in Jesus Christ is friendship. And oftentimes we don't return it with friendship. We return it with evil. And God, in Jesus, would have every right to call down a curse upon us and doesn't. Instead, he takes on the curse himself. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He becomes the curse that we've been talking about for us. That's how much he loves us as we sing to ourselves and sing over us. Scripture says that he takes the curse upon himself so that we wouldn't. And Jesus, as we look at this cup, Jesus takes that cup of judgment. He takes that cup of curse so that we might be able to come to this table today and receive the cup of forgiveness, receive the cup of grace, receive the cup of mercy, receive the cup of love, and receive the cup of salvation. All are invited to this table. So I invite you to come. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, who your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor to proclaim release of the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. He delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and he gave thanks to you and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has come among us. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ abides with us. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As I have stated...
Uh, this is the table of the Lord. I'm going to invite my wife Kelly to uh, come and help me as we serve this. We do have a gluten-free option as well. As you see that I'm trying to make a few efforts here for us for sure in masking. You will see us using the hand sanitizer and trying to uh, be mindful of our current situations as they are in our world today. Um, so everything is prepared. I invite for you to come forward uh, from the front to the back. out of service, I invite you to stand up as we sing. Never let go, 
through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go of every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go. Lord, you never let go of me. Oh no, you never let go. Receive this blessing. As those who know the love of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, may we go from this place knowing that he never lets us go, even through weeping and crying and thrashing around in anger. It does not matter. He goes with us from this place. May we go from this place filled with his joy, knowing that we have Christ's peace within us. Amen. Have a blessed week. We'll see you all next week.